Chapter sixty five of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter sixty five. The Wall. On the day after the last triad in the housekeeper's parlor, as Donal sat in the schoolroom with Davy, about noon it was, he became aware that for some time he had been hearing laborious blows apparently at a great distance. Now that he attended, they seemed to be in the castle itself, deadened by mass, not distance. With a fear gradually becoming more definite, he sat listening for a few moments. Davy, he said, run and see what is going on. The boy came rushing back in great excitement. Oh, Mr. Grant, what do you think? he cried. I do believe my father is after the lost room. They are breaking down a wall. Where? asked Donal, half starting from his seat. In the little room behind the halfway room. On the stair, you know. Donal was silent. What might not be the consequences? You may go and see them at work, Davy, he said. We shall have no more lessons this morning. Was your papa with them? No, sir. At least, I did not see him. Simmons told me he sent for the masons this morning and set them to take the wall down. Oh, thank you, Mr. Grant. It is such fun. I do wonder what is behind it. It may be a place you know quite well, or a place you never saw before. Davy ran off, and Donal instantly sped to a corner where he had hidden some tools, thence to Lady Arctura's deserted room, and so to the oak door. He remembered seeing another staple in the same post, a little lower down. If he could get that out, he would drive it in beside the remains of the other, so as to hold the bolt of the lock. If the earl knew the way in, as doubtless he did, he must not learn that another had found it. Not yet, at least. As he went down, every blow of the masons pounding at the wall seemed in his very ears. He peeped through the press door. They had not yet got through the wall. No light was visible. He made haste to restore things, only a stool and a few papers, to their exact positions when first he entered. Close to him, on the other side of the partition, shaking the place, the huge blows were falling like those of a ram on the wall of a besieged city, of which he was the whole garrison. He stepped into the press and drew the door after him. With his last glance behind him he saw, in the faint gleam of light that came with it, a stone fall. He must make haste. The demolition would go on much faster now, but before they had the opening large enough to pass, he would have done what he wanted. With a strong piece of iron for a lever, he drew the staple from the post, then drove it in astride of the bolt, careful to time his blows to those of the masons. That done, he ran down to the chapel, gathered what dust he could sweep up from behind the altar and laid it on its top, restored on the bed with its own dust a little of the outline of what had lain there, dropped the slab to its place in the floor of the passage, closed the door of the chapel with some difficulty because of its broken hinge, and ascended. The sounds of battering had ceased, and as he passed the oak door he laid his ear to it. Someone was in the place, the lid of the bureau shut with a loud bang, and he heard a lock turned. The wall could not be half down yet. The earl must have entered the moment he could get through. Donal hastened up and out of the dreadful place, put the slab in the opening, secured it with a strut against the opposite side of the recess, and closed the shutters and drew the curtains of the room. If the earl came up the stair in the wall, found the stone immovable, and saw no light through any chink about its edges, he would not suspect it had been displaced. He then went to Lady Arctura. I have a great deal to tell you, he said, but at this moment I cannot. I am afraid of the earl finding me with you. Why should you mind that? said Arctura. Because I think he is suspicious about the lost room. He has had a wall taken down this morning. Please do not let him see you know anything about it. Davy thinks he is set on finding the lost room. I think he knew all about it long ago. You can ask him what he has been doing. You must have heard the masons. I hope I shall not stumble into anything like a story, for if I do I must out with everything. In the afternoon, Davy was full of the curious little place his father had discovered behind the wall. But if that was the lost room, he said, it was not at all worth making such a fuss about. It was nothing but a big closet with an old desk kind of thing in it. In the afternoon also, the Earl went to see his niece. It was the first time they met after his rude behavior on her proposal to search for the lost room. "'What were you doing this morning, Uncle?' she said. "'There was such a thumping and banging somewhere in the castle.' "'Davy said you were determined, he thought, to find the lost room.' "'Nothing of the kind, my love,' answered the earl. "'I do hope they will not spoil the stair carrying the stones and mortar down.' "'What was it, then, uncle?' "'Simply this, my dear. 
My late wife, your aunt and I, had a plan for taking that closet behind my room on the stair into the room itself. In preparation, I had a wall built across the middle of the closet so as to divide it and make two recesses of it and act also as a buttress to the weakened wall. Then your aunt died, and I hadn't the heart to open the recesses or do anything more in the matter. So one half of the closet was cut off and remained inaccessible. But there had been left in it an old bureau containing papers of some consequence, for it was heavy, and intended to occupy the same position after the arches were opened. Now as it happens, I want one of those papers, so the wall has had to come down again. "'But, Uncle, what a pity,' said Arctura. "'Why did you not open the arches? "'The recesses would have been so pretty in that room. "'I am sorry I did not think of asking you "'what you would like done about it, my child. "'The fact is I never thought of your taking any interest in the matter. "'I had naturally lost all mine. "'You will please to observe, however, "'I have only restored what I had myself disarranged, "'not meddled with anything belonging to the castle. "'But now you have the masons here, "'why not go on and make a little search for the lost room?' "'said Arctura. "'venturing once more. "'We might pull down the castle and be none the wiser. "'Bah! The building up of half the closet "'may have given rise to the whole story. "'Surely, Uncle, the legend is older than that. "'It may be. You cannot be sure. "'Once a-going, it would immediately cry back to a remote age. "'Prove that anyone ever spoke of it "'before the building of that foolish wall. "'Surely some remember hearing it long before that. "'Nothing is more treacherous than a memory "'confronted with a general belief,' "'said the Earl, and took his leave.' The next morning Arctura went to see the alteration. She opened the door of the little room. It was twice its former size, and two bureaus were standing against the wall. She peeped into the cupboard at the end of it, but saw nothing there. The same morning she made up her mind that she would go no farther at present in regard to the chapel. It would be to break with her uncle. In the evening she acquainted Donal with her resolve, and he could not say she was wrong. There was no necessity for opposing her uncle, there might soon come one. He told her how he had entered the closet from behind, and of the noise he had made the night before, which had perhaps led to the opening of the place. But he did not tell her of what he had found on the bureau. The time might come when he must do so, but now he dared not render her relations with her uncle yet more uncomfortable. Neither was it likely such a woman would consent to marry such a man as her cousin had shown himself. When that danger appeared it would be time to interpose. For the mere succession to an empty title— he was not sure that he was bound to speak. The branch which could produce such scions might well be itself a false graft on the true stem of the family. If not, what was the family worth? He must at all events be sure it was his business before he moved in the matter. End of chapter 65《Chapter 66 of Donald Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 66. Progress and Change. Things went on very quietly for a time. Arctura grew better, resumed her studies, and made excellent progress. She would have worked harder, but Donald would not let her. He hated forcing— even with the good will of the plant itself. He believed in a holy, unhasting growth. God's ways want God's time. Long after, people would sometimes say to him, That is very well in the abstract, but in these days of hurry a young fellow would that way be left ages behind. With God, would Donal say, Tut, tut, the thing would never work. For your ends, Donal would answer, It certainly would never work. But your ends are not those of the universe. I do not pretend they are, but they are the success of the boy. That is one of the ends of the universe, and your reward will be to thwart it for a season. I decline to make one in a conspiracy against the design of our Creator. I would fain die loyal. He was, of course, laughed at, and not a little despised, as an extravagant enthusiast. But those who laughed found it hard to say for what he was enthusiastic. It seemed hardly for education, when he would even do what he could sometimes to keep a pupil back. He did not care to make the best of anyone. The truth was, Donal's best was so many miles ahead of theirs that it was below their horizon altogether. If there be any relation between time and the human mind, every forcing of human process, whether in spirit or intellect, is hurtful, a retarding of God's plan. Lady Arctura's old troubles were gradually fading into the limbo of vanities. At times, however, mostly when unwell, 
they would come in upon her like a flood. What if, after all, God were the self-loving being theology presented, a being from whom no loving human heart could but recoil with a holy dislike? What if it was because of a nature specially evil that she could not accept the God in whom the priests and elders of her people believed? But again and again, in the midst of profound wretchedness from such doubt, had a sudden flush of the world's beauty, that beauty which Jesus has told us to consider, and the modern Pharisee to avoid, broken like gentlest, mightiest sunrise through the hellish fog, and she had felt a power upon her as from the heart of a very God, a God such as she would give her life to believe in, one before whom she would cast herself in speechless adoration, not of his greatness, of that she felt little, but of his loving kindness, the gentleness that was making her great. Then would she care utterly for God and his Christ, nothing for what men said about them. The Lord never meant his lambs to be under the tyranny of any, least of all the tyranny of his own most imperfect church. Its work is to teach. Where it cannot teach, it must not rule. Then would God appear to her not only true, but real, the heart of the human to which she could cling and so rest. The corruption of all religion comes of leaving the human, and God is the causing human, for something imagined holier. Men who do not see the loveliness of the truth search till they find a lie they can call lovely. What but a human reality could the heart of man ever love? What else are we offered in Jesus but the absolutely human? That Jesus has two natures is of the most mischievous fictions of theology. The divine and the human are not two. Suddenly, after an absence of months, reappeared Lord Forgue, cheerful, manly, on the best terms with his father, and plainly willing to be on still better terms with his cousin. He had left the place a mooning youth. He came back a man of the world, easy in carriage, courteous in manners, serene in temper, abounding in what seemed the results of observation, attentive but not too attentive, jolly with Davy, distant with Donal, polite to all. Donal could hardly receive the evidence of his senses. He would have wondered more had he known every factor in the change. All about him seemed to say it should not be his fault if the follies of his youth remained unforgotten, and his airy carriage sat well upon him. Nonetheless, Donal felt there was no restoration of the charm which had at first attracted him. That was utterly vanished. He felt certain he had been going downhill, and was now, instead of negatively, consciously and positively untrue. With gradations undefined, but not unmarked of Donal, as if the man found himself under influences of which the youth had been unaware, he began to show himself not indifferent to the attractions of his cousin. He expressed concern that her health was not what it had been, sought her in her room when she did not appear, professed an interest in knowing what books she was reading and what were her studies with Donal, behaved like a good brother-cousin who would not be sorry to be something more. And now the earl, to the astonishment of the household, began to appear at table, and apparently as a consequence of this, Donal was requested, rather than invited, to take his meals with the family, not altogether to his satisfaction, seeing he could not only read while he ate alone, but could get through more quickly, and have the time thus saved for things of greater consequence. His presence made it easier for Lord Forgue to act his part, and the manners he brought to the front left little to be desired. He bowed to the judgment of Arctura, and seemed to welcome that of his father, to whom he was now as respectful as moralist could desire." yet he sometimes faced a card he did not mean to show. Who that is not absolutely true can escape the mishap? There was condescension in his politeness to Donal. And this, had there been nothing else, would have been enough to revolt Arctura. But in truth, he impressed her altogether as a man of outsides. She felt that she did not see the man he was, but the nearest approach he could make to the man he would be taken for. He was gracious, dignified, responsive, kind, amusing, accurate, ready, everything but true. He would make of his outer man all but what it was meant for, a revelation of the inner. It was that notwithstanding. He was a man dressed in a man, and his dress was a revelation of much that he was, while he intended it only to show much that he was not. No man can help unveiling himself, however long he may escape even his own detection. There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed." Things were meant to come out and be read and understood in the face of the universe. The soul of every man is as a secret book, whose content is yet written on its cover for the reading of the wise. How differently it is read by the fool, 
whose very understanding is a misunderstanding. He takes a man for a god when on the point of being eaten up of worms. He buys for thirty pieces of silver him whom the sepulchre cannot hold. Well for those in the world of revelation who give their sins no quarter in this. Forgue had been in Edinburgh a part of the time, in England another part. He had many things to tell of the people he had seen, and the sports he had shared in. He had developed and enlarged a vein of gentlemanly satire, which he kept supplied by the observation and analysis of the peculiarities, generally weaknesses, of others. These, as a matter of course, he judged merely by the poor standard of society. Question concerning any upon the larger human scale, he could give no account of them. To Donal's eyes, the man was a shallow pool, whose surface brightness concealed the muddy bottom. End of chapter 66《ハプトゥルガーディアルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥルドゥル But after an accident to a favorite horse, for which she blamed herself, she had scarcely ridden at all. It was quite as much, however, from the influence of Miss Carmichael upon her spirits that she had forsaken the exercise. Partly because her uncle was neither much respected nor much liked, she had visited very little, and after mental trouble assailed her, growing under the false prescriptions of the soul doctor she had called in, she withdrew more and more, avoiding even company she would have enjoyed, and which would before now have led her to resume it. For a time she persisted in refusing to ride with Forgu. In vain he offered his horse, assuring her that Davy's pony was quite able to carry him. She had no inclination to ride, she said. But at last one day, lest she should be guilty of unkindness, she consented, and so enjoyed the ride, felt indeed so much the better for it, that she did not thereafter so positively as before decline to allow her cousin to look out for a horse fit to carry her. And Forgu, taking her consent for granted, succeeded, with the help of the factor, in finding for her a beautiful creature, just of the sort to please her. Almost at sight of him, she agreed to his purchase. This put Forgu in great spirits and much contentment with himself. He did not doubt that, gaining thus opportunity so excellent, he would quickly succeed in withdrawing her from the absurd influence which, to his dismay, he discovered his enemy had in his absence gained over her. He ought not to have been such a fool, he said to himself, as to leave the poor child to the temptations naturally arising in such a dreary solitude. He noted with satisfaction, however, that the parson's daughter seemed to have forsaken the house. And now at last, having got rid of the folly that a while possessed him, he was prepared to do his duty by the family, and to that end would make unfaltering use of the fascinations experience had taught him he was, in a most exceptional degree, gifted with. He would at once take Arctura's education in his own hands and give his full energy to it. She should speedily learn the difference between the assistance of a gentleman and that of a clot pole. He had in England improved in his writing as well as his manners, and knew at least how a gentleman, if not how a man, ought to behave to the beast that carried him. Also, having ridden a good deal with ladies, he was now able to give Arctura not a few hints to the improvement of her seat, her hand, her courage. Nor was there any nearer road, he judged from what he knew of his cousin, to her confidence and gratitude than showing her a better way in a thing. But thinking that in teaching her to ride, he could make her forget the man who had been teaching her to live, he was not a little mistaken in the woman he desired to captivate. He did not yet love her even in the way he called loving, else he might have been less confident, but he found her very pleasing, invigorated by the bright frosty air, the life of the animal under her. And the exultation of rapid motion, she seemed better in health, more merry and full of life than he had ever seen her. He put all down to his success with her. He was incapable of suspecting how little of it was owing to him, incapable of believing how much to the fact that she now turned to the father of spirits without fear, almost without doubt, thought of him as the root of every delight of the world. At the heart of the horse she rode, in the wind that blew joy into hers as she swept through its yielding bosom. Knew him as altogether loving and true, the Father of Jesus Christ, as like him as like could be like. 
more like him than anyone else in the universe could be like another, like him as only eternal son can be like eternal father. It was no wonder that with such a well of living water in her heart she should be glad, merry even, and ready for anything her horse could do. Flying across a field in the very wildness of pleasure, her hair streaming behind her, and her pale face glowing, she would now and then take a jump Forgood declared he could not face in cold blood. He did not know how far from cold her blood was. He began to wonder he had been such a fool as to neglect her for, well, never mind, and to feel something that was like love, and was indeed admiration. But for the searing brand of his past he might have loved her truly, as a man may without being the most exalted of mortals. For in love we are beyond our ordinary selves. The deep thing in us peers up into the human air, and is of God. Therefore cannot live long in the mephitic air of a selfish and low nature, but sinks again out of sight." He was not at his ease with Arctura. He was afraid of her. When a man is conscious of wrong, knows in his history what would draw a hideous smudge over the portrait he would present to the eyes of her he would please, he may well be afraid of her. He makes liberal allowance for himself, but is not sure she will. And before Forgu lay a social gulf which he could pass only on the narrow plank of her favor. The more he was with her, the more he admired her, the more he desired to marry her. The more satisfied he grew with his own improvement, the more determined he became that for no poor, unjust scruples would he forgo his happiness. There was but one trifle to be kept from the world. It might know everything else about him, and once in possession of the property, who would dispute the title? Then again, he was not certain that his father had not merely invented a threat. Surely if the fact were such, he would, even in rage diabolical, have kept it to himself. Impetuous, and accustomed to what he counted success, he soon began to make plainer advance toward the end on which his self-love and cupidity at least were set. But knowing in a vague manner how he had carried himself before he went, Arctura, uninfluenced by the ways of the world, her judgment unwarped, her perception undimmed, her instinct nice, her personal delicacy exacting, had never imagined he could approach her on any ground but that of cousinship and a childhood of shared sports. She had seen that Donal was far from pleased with him, and believed Forgu knew that she knew he had been behaving badly. Her behavior to him was indeed largely based on the fact that he was in disgrace. She was sorry for him. By and by, however, she perceived that she had been allowing too much freedom where she was not prepared to allow more, and so one day declined to go with him. They had not had a ride for a fortnight, the weather having been unfavorable, and now, when a morning broke into the season like a smile from an estranged friend, she would not go. He was annoyed then alarmed, fearing adverse influence. They were alone in the breakfast-room. "'Why will you not, Arctura?' he asked reproachfully. "'Do you not feel well?' "'I am quite well,' she answered. "'It is such a lovely day,' he pleaded. "'I am not in the mood. There are other things in the world besides writing, and I have been wasting my time, writing too much. I have learnt next to nothing since Larky came. Oh, bother, what have you to do with learning? Health is the first thing.' "'I don't think so.' and learning is good for the health. Besides, I would not be a mere animal for perfect health. Let me help you, then, with your studies. Thank you, she answered, laughing a little, but I have a good master already. We, that is Davy and I, are reading Greek and mathematics with Mr. Grant. Forgu's face flushed. I ought to know as much of both as he does, he said. Ought, perhaps, but you know you do not. I know enough to be your tutor. Yes, but I know enough not to be your pupil. What do you mean? that you can't teach. How do you know that? Because you do not love either Greek or mathematics, and no one who does not love can teach. That is nonsense. If I don't love Greek enough to teach it, I love you enough to teach you, said Forgu. You are my writing master, said Arctura. Mr. Grant is my master in Greek. Forgu strangled an imprecation on Mr. Grant and tried to laugh, but there was not a laugh inside him. Then you won't ride today, he said. I think not replied Arctura. She ought to have said she would not. It is a pity to let doubt alight on decision. Her reply reopened the whole question. "'I cannot see what should induce you to allow that fellow the honour of reading with you,' said Forgu. "'He's a long-winded, pedantic, ill-bred lout.' "'Mr. Grant is my friend,' said Arctura, and raising her head looked him in the eyes. "'Take my word for it, you are mistaken in him,' he said. "'I neither value nor ask your opinion of him,' returned Arctura. I merely acquaint you with the fact that he is my friend. 
"'Here's the devil and all to pay,' thought Forgu. "'I beg your pardon,' he said. "'You do not know him as I do.' "'Not? And with so much better opportunity of judging?' "'He has never played the dominie with you,' said Forgu foolishly. "'Indeed he has. He has. Confound his insolence! How?' "'He won't let me study as I want. How has he interfered with you?' "'We won't quarrel about him,' rejoined Forgu, attempting a tone of gaiety, but instantly growing serious. "'We who ought to be so much to each other.' Something told him he had already gone too far. "'I do not know what you mean. Or rather, I am not willing to think I know what you mean,' said Arctura. "'After what took place?' In her turn she ceased. He had said nothing. "'Jealous,' concluded Forgu. "'A good sign.' "'I see he has been talking against me,' he said. "'If you mean Mr. Grant, you mistake. "'He never, so far as I remember, once mentioned you to me. "'I know better. "'You are rude. "'He never spoke of it, but I have seen enough with my own eyes. "'If you mean that silly fancy, why, Arctura, "'you know it was but a boyish folly. "'And since then you have grown a man. "'How many months has it taken? "'I assure you, on the word of a gentleman, there is nothing in it now. "'It is all over, and I am heartily ashamed of it.' "'A pause of a few seconds followed.' It seemed as many minutes, and unbearable. "'You will come out with me?' said Forgu. She might be relenting, though she did not look like it. "'No,' she said. "'I will not.' "'Well,' he returned, with simulated coolness, "'this is rather cavalier treatment, I must say, "'to throw a man over who has loved you so long, "'and for the sake of a lesson in Greek.' "'How long, pray, have you loved me?' said Arctura, growing angry. "'I was willing to be friendly with you,' "'so much so that I am sorry it is no longer possible. "'You punish me pretty sharply, my lady, "'for a trifle of which I told you I was ashamed,' "'said Forgu, biting his lip. "'It was the merest—' "'I do not wish to hear anything about it,' "'said Arctura sternly. "'Then, afraid she had been unkind, "'she added in altered tone, "'You had better go and have a gallop. "'You may have Larky if you like.' "'He turned and left the room. "'She only meant to pique him,' he said to himself. "'She had been cherishing her displeasure.' and now that she had had her revenge would feel better and be sorry next. It was a very good morning's work after all. It was absurd to think she preferred a Greek lesson from a clown to a ride with Lord Forgu. Was not she too a Grame? Partly to make the reconciliation the easier, partly because the horse was superior to his own, he would ride Larky. But his reasoning was not so satisfactory to him as to put him in a good temper, and poor Larky had to suffer for his ill-humour. His least movement that displeased him put him in a rage, and he rode him so foolishly as well as tyrannically that he brought him home quite lame, thus putting an end for a time to all hope of riding again with Arctura. Instead of going and telling her what he had done, he sent for the farrier, and gave orders that the mishap should not be mentioned. A week passed, and then another, and as he could say nothing about riding, he was in a measure self-banished from Arctura's company. A furious jealousy began to master him. He scorned to give place to it because of the insult to himself if he allowed a true ground for it. But it gradually gained power. This country bumpkin, this cowherd, this man of spelling books and grammars to come between his cousin and him. Of course he was not so silly as imagined for a moment she cared for him. That she would disgrace herself by falling in love with a fellow just loose from the plough-tail. She was a grame, and could never be a traitor to her blood. If only he had not been such an infernal fool— a vulgar little thing without an idea in her head, so unpleasant, so disgusting at last with her love-making. Nothing pleased her but hugging and kissing. That was how he spoke to himself of the girl he had been in love with. Damn that schoolmaster! She would never fall in love with him, but he might prevent her from falling in love with another. No attractions could make way against certain prepossessions. The girl had a fancy for being a saint, and the lout burned incense to her. So much he gathered from Davy. His father must get rid of the fellow. If he thought he was doing so well with Davy, why not send the two away together till things were settled? But the Earl thought it would be better to win Donal. He counselled him that every Grant was Lord Seafield's cousin, and every Highlander an implacable enemy where his pride was hurt. His lordship did not reflect that, if what he said were true of Donal, he must have left the castle long ago. There was but one thing that would have made it impossible for Donal to remain, interference, namely, between him and his pupil. Forgu did not argue with his father. He had given that up. At the same time, if he had told all that had passed between him and Donal, the Earl would have confessed he had advised an impossibility. Forgu took a step in a very different direction. 
he began to draw to himself the good graces of Miss Carmichael. He did not know how little she could serve him. Without being consciously insincere, she flattered him and speedily gained his confidence. Well descended on the mother's side, she had grown up fit, her father said, to adorn any society. With a keen appreciation of the claims and dignities of the aristocracy, she was well able to flatter the prejudices she honored and shared in. Careful not to say a word against his cousin, she made him feel more and more that his chief danger lay in the influence of Donal. She fanned thus his hatred of the man who first came between him and his wrath, next between him and his love, and last between him and his fortunes. If only Davy would fall ill and require a change of air. But Davy was always in splendid health. Now that he saw himself in such danger of failing, he fancied himself far more in love with Arctura than he was and as he got familiarized with the idea of his illegitimacy, although he would not assent to it, he made less and less of it, which would have been a proof to any other than himself that he believed it. In further sign of the same, he made no inquiry into the matter, did not once even question his father about it. If it was true, he did not want to know it. He would treat his lack of proof as ignorance, and act as with the innocence of ignorance. A fellow must take for granted what was commonly believed. At last, and the last was not long in arriving, he almost ceased to trouble himself about it. His father laughed at his fear of failure with Arctura, but at times contemplated the thing as an awful possibility, not that he loved Forgu much. The only way fathers in sight of the grave can fancy themselves holding on to the things they must leave is in their children. But Lord Morven had a stronger and better reason for his unrighteousness. In a troubled, self-reproachful way, he loved the memory of their mother, and through her cared even for Forgu more than he knew. They were also his own as much as if he had been legally married to her. For the relation in which they stood to society, he cared little so long as it continued undiscovered. He enjoyed the idea of stealing a march on society, and seeing the sons he had left at such a disadvantage behind him, ruffling it in spite of absurd law with the foolish best. From the grave he would so have his foot on the neck of his enemy law. He was one of the many who can rejoice in even a stolen victory. Nor would he ever have been the fool to let the truth fly, except under the reaction of evil drugs, and the rush of fierce wrath at the threatened ruin of his cherished scheme. Arctura thenceforth avoided her cousin as much as she could, only remembering that the house was hers, and she must not make him feel he was not welcome to use it. They met at meals, and she tried to behave as if nothing unpleasant had happened, and things were as before he went away. "'You are very cruel, Arctura,' he said one morning he met her in the Terrace Avenue. "'Cruel,' returned Arctura coldly. "'I am not cruel. I would not willingly hurt anyone. "'You hurt me much. You give me not a morsel, not a crumb of your society.' "'Percy,' said Arctura, "'if you will be content to be my cousin we shall get on well enough. "'But if you are set on what cannot be, once for all, believe me, it is of no use. "'You care for none of the things I live for.' I feel as if we belong to different worlds so little have we in common. You may think me hard, but it is better we should understand each other. If you imagine that because I have the property you have a claim on me, be sure I will never acknowledge it. I would a thousand times rather you had the property and I were in my grave. I will be anything, do anything, learn anything you please, cried Forgu, his heart aching with disappointment. I know what such submission is worth, said Arctura. I should be everything till we were married, and then nothing. You dissemble, you hide even from yourself, but you are not hard to read. Perhaps she would not have spoken just so severely, had she not been that morning unusually annoyed with his behavior to Donal, and at the same time specially pleased with the calm, unconsciously dignified way in which Donal took it. Casting it from him as the rock throws aside the sea wave, it did not concern him. The dull world has got the wrong phrase. It is he who resents an affront who pockets it. He who takes no notice lets it lie in the dirt. End of chapter 67「Chapter 68 of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 68. Larky. It was a lovely day in spring. Please, Mr. Grant, said Davy, may I have a holiday? 
Donna looked at him with a little wonder. The boy had never before made such a request. But he answered him at once. Yes, certainly, Davy. But I should like to know what you want it for. Arky very much wants to have a ride today. She says Larky, I gave him his name, to rhyme with Arky. She says Larky will forget her, and she does not wish to go out with Forgu, so she wants me to go with her on my pony. You will take good care of her, Davy. I will take care of her, but you need not be anxious about us, Mr. Grant. Arky is a splendid rider, and much pluckier than she used to be. Donald did, however, he could not have said why, feel a little anxiety. He repressed it as unfaithfulness, but it kept returning. He could not go with them. There was no horse for him, and to go on foot would, he feared, spoil their ride. He was so much afraid also of presuming on Lady Arctura's regard for him that he would have shrunk from offering had it been more feasible. He got a book and strolled into the park, not even going to see them off. Forgu might be about the stable and make things unpleasant. Had Forgu been about the stable, he would, I think, have somehow managed to prevent the ride, for Larky, though much better, was not yet cured of his lameness. Arctura did not know he had been lame, or that he had therefore been very little exercised, and was now rather wild, with a pastern joint far from equal to his spirit. There was but a boy about the stable, who either did not understand or was afraid to speak. She rode in a danger of which she knew nothing. The consequence was that, jumping the merest little ditch in a field outside the park, they had a fall. The horse got up and trotted limping to the stable. His mistress lay where she fell. Davy, wild with misery, galloped home. From the height of the park, Donal saw him tearing along and knew something was amiss. He ran, got over the wall, found the pony's track, and following it, came where Arctura lay. There was a little clear water in the ditch. He wet his handkerchief and bathed her face. She came to herself, opened her eyes with a faint smile, and tried to raise herself, but fell back helpless and closed her eyes again. "'I believe I am hurt,' she murmured. "'I think Larky must have fallen.' Donal would have carried her, but she moaned so that he gave up the idea at once. Davy was gone for help. It would be better to wait. He pulled off his coat and laid it over her, then kneeling, raised her head a little from the damp ground upon his arm. She let him do as he pleased, but did not open her eyes. They had not long to wait. Several came running, among them Lord Forgu. He fell beside his cousin on his knees and took her hand in his. She neither moved nor spoke. As instead of doing anything, he merely persisted in claiming her attention, Donal saw it was for him to give orders. "'My lady is much hurt,' he said. "'One of you go at once for the doctor. "'The others bring a hand-barrow. "'I know there is one about the place. "'Lay the squab of a sofa on it and make haste. "'Let Mistress Brooks know.' "'Mind your own business,' said Forgu. "'Do as Mr. Grant tells you,' said Lady Arctura, "'without opening her eyes.' "'The men departed running. "'Forgu rose from his knees "'and walked slowly to a little distance "'where he stood gnawing his lip. "'My lord,' said Donal, "'please run and fetch a little brandy for her ladyship.' She has fainted. What could Forgu do but obey? He started at once, and with tolerable speed. Then Arctura opened her eyes and smiled. "'Are you suffering much, my lady?' asked Donal. "'A good deal,' she answered. "'But I don't mind it. Thank you for not leaving me. It is no more than I can bear, only bad when I try to move.' "'They will not be long now,' he said. Again she closed her eyes and was silent. Donal watched the sweet face— which a cloud of suffering would every now and then cross, and lifted up his heart to the Saviour of men. He saw them coming with the extemporized litter, behind them Mistress Brooks, with Forgu and one of the maids. When she came up, she addressed herself in silence to Donal. He told her he feared her ladyship's spine was hurt. After his direction, she put her hands under her, and the maid took her feet, while he, placing his other arm under her shoulders and gently rising, raised her body. Being all strong and gentle, they managed the moving well, and laid her slowly on the litter. Except a moan or two, and a gathering of the brows, she gave no sign of suffering. Nothing to be called a cry escaped her. Donal at the head, and a groom at the foot, lifted the litter, and with ordered step started for the house. Once or twice she opened her eyes and looked up at Donal, then, as if satisfied, closed them again. Before they reached the house the doctor met them, for they had to walk slowly. Forgu came behind, in a devilish humour. He knew that first his ill-usage of Larky, 
and then his preventing anything being said about it must have been the cause of the accident. But he felt with some satisfaction, for self simply makes devils of us, that if she had not refused to go out with him, it would not have happened. He would not have allowed her to mount Larky. Served her right, he caught himself saying once, and was ashamed. But presently said it again. Self is as full of worms as it can hold. God deliver us from it. End of chapter 68《Chapter 69 of Donal Grant》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 69 The Sick Chamber. She was carried to her room and laid on her bed. The doctor requested Mrs. Brooks and Donal to remain and dismissed the rest, then proceeded to examine her. There were no bones broken, he said, but she must be kept very quiet. The windows must be darkened, and she must, if possible, sleep. She gave Donal a faint smile and a pitiful glance, but did not speak. As he was following the doctor from the room, she made a sign to Mrs. Brooks with her eyes that she wanted to speak to him. He came and bent over to hear, for she spoke very feebly. You will... "'Come and see me, Mr. Grant?' "'I will indeed, my lady.' "'Every day?' "'Yes, most certainly,' he replied. She smiled, and so dismissed him. He went with his heart full. A little way from the door stood Forgue, waiting for him to come out. He had sent the doctor to his father. Donal passed him with a bend of the head. He followed him to the schoolroom. "'It is time this farce was over, Grant,' he said. "'Farce, my lord?' "'repeated Donal indignantly. "'These attentions to my lady. "'I have paid her no more attention "'than I would your lordship had you required it,' "'answered Donal sternly. "'That would have been convenient, doubtless. "'But there has been enough of humbug, "'and now for an end to it. "'Ever since you came here "'you have been at work on the mind "'of that inexperienced girl, "'with your damned religion, "'for what end you know best, "'and now you've half killed her "'by persuading her to go out with you instead of me. "'The brute was lame and not fit to ride. "'Any fool might have seen that.' "'I had nothing to do with her going, my lord. "'She asked Davy to go with her, and he had a holiday on purpose. "'All very fine, but, my lord, I have told you the truth, "'but not to justify myself. "'You must be aware your opinion is of no value in my eyes. "'But tell me one thing, my lord. "'If my lady's horse was lame, how was it she did not know? "'You did.' "'Forgue thought Donal knew more than he did, and was taken aback. "'It is time the place was clear of you,' he said. "'I am your father's servant, not yours,' answered Donal, "'and do not trouble myself as to your pleasure concerning me. "'But I think it is only fair to warn you that, "'though you cannot hurt me, "'nothing but honesty can take you out of my power.' "'Forgue turned on his heel, went to his father, "'and told him he knew now that Donal was prejudicing "'the mind of Lady Arctura against him. "'But not until it came in the course of the conversation "'did he mention the accident she had had. "'The Earl professed himself greatly shocked.' got up with something almost like alacrity from his sofa, and went down to inquire after his niece. He would have compelled Mrs. Brooks to admit him, but she was determined her lady should not be waked from a sleep invaluable to her for the sake of receiving his condolments, and he had to return to his room without gaining anything. If she were to go, the property would be his, and he could will it as he pleased. That was, if she left no will. He sent for his son and cautioned him over and over to do nothing to offend her, but wait. What might come, who could tell? It might prove a serious affair. Forgue tried to feel shocked at the coolness of his father's speculation, but allowed that, if she was determined not to receive him as her husband, the next best thing, in the exigence of affairs, would certainly be that she should leave a world for whose uses she was ill-fitted, and go where she would be happier. The things she would then have no farther need of would be welcome to those to whom by right they belonged more really than to her. She was a pleasant thing to look upon, and if she had loved him he would rather have had the property with than without her, but there was this advantage, he would be left free to choose. Lady Arctura lay suffering, feverish, and restless. Mrs. Brooks would let no one sit up with her but herself. The Earl would have sent for a suitable nurse, a friend of his in London would find one, but she would not hear of it. And before the night was over she had greater reason still for refusing to yield her post. 
it was evident her young mistress was more occupied with Donal Grant than with the pain she was suffering. In her delirium she was constantly desiring his presence. "'I know he can help me,' she would say. "'He is a shepherd, like the Lord himself.' And Mistress Brooks, though by no means devoid of the prejudices of the rank with which her life had been so much associated, could not but allow that a nobler life must be possible with one like Donal Grant than with one like Lord Forgue. In the middle of the night Arctura became so unquiet that her nurse, calling the maid she had in a room near, flew like a bird to Donal, and asked him to come down. He had but partially undressed, thinking his help might be wanted, and was down almost as soon as she. Ere he came, however, she had dismissed the maid. Donal went to the bedside. Arctura was moaning and starting, sometimes opening her eyes, but distinguishing nothing. Her hand lay on the counterpane. He laid his upon it. She gave a sigh as of one relieved. A smile came flickering over her face, and she lay still for some time. Donal sat down beside her and watched. The moment he saw her begin to be restless or look distressed, he laid his hand upon hers. She was immediately quiet, and lay for a time as if she knew herself safe. When she seemed about to wake, he withdrew. So things went on for many nights. Donal slept instead of working when his duties with Davy were over, and lay at night in the corridor, wrapped in his plaid. For even after Arctura began to recover, her nights were sorely troubled, and her restoration would have been much retarded had not Donal been near to make her feel she was not abandoned to the terrors she passed through. One night the Earl, wandering about in the anomalous condition of neither ghost nor genuine mortal, came suddenly upon what he took for a huge animal in wait to devour. He was not terrified, for he was accustomed to such things, and thought at first it was not of this world. He had no doubt of the reality of his visions, even when he knew they were invisible to others, and even in his waking moments had begun to believe in them as much as in the things then evident to him, or rather, perhaps, to disbelieve equally in both. He approached to see what it was, and stood staring down upon the mass. Gently it rose and confronted him, if confronting that may be called where the face remained so undefined, for Donal took care to keep his plaid over his head. He had hope in the probable condition of the earl. He turned from him and walked away. End of chapter 69「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 70 A Plot But his lordship had his suspicions, and took measures to confirm or set them at rest, with the result that he concluded Donald madly in love with his niece, and unable while she was ill to rest anywhere but with the devotion of a savage outside her door. If he did not take precautions, the lout would oust the lord. Ever since Donal spoke so plainly against his self-indulgence, he had not merely hated but feared the country lad. He recognized that Donal feared nothing, had no respect of persons, would speak out before the world. He was doubtful also whether he had not allowed him to know more than it was well he should know. It was time to get rid of him, only it must be done cautiously, with the appearance of a good understanding. If he had him out of the house before she was able to see him again, that would do, and if in the meantime she should die, all would be well. His distrust, once roused, went farther than that of his son. He had not the same confidence in blue blood. He knew a few things more than Forgue, believed it quite possible that the daughter of a long descent of lords and ladies should fall in love with a shepherd lad and as no one could tell what might have to be done if the legal owner of the property persisted in refusing her hand to the rightful owner of it, the fellow might be seriously in the way. Arctura slowly recovered. She had not yet left her room, but had been a few hours on the couch every day for a fortnight, and the doctor, now sanguine of her final recovery, began to talk of carrying her to the library. The earl, who never suspected that Mrs. Brooks, having hitherto kept himself from her room, would admit the tutor, the moment he learned that the library was in view for her, decided that there must be no more delay. He had by this time contrived a neat little plan. He sent for Donal. He had been thinking, the earl said, that he must want a holiday. He had not seen his parents since he came to the castle, 
and he had been thinking besides how desirable it was that Davy should see some other phases of life than those to which he had hitherto been accustomed. There was great danger of boys brought up in his position getting narrow, and careless of the lives and feelings of their fellow men. He would take it as a great kindness if Donal, who had a regard to the real education of his pupil, would take him to his home, and let him understand the ways of life among the humbler classes of the nation, so that, if ever he went into Parliament, he might have the advantage of knowing the heart of the people for whom he would have to legislate. Donal listened, and could not but agree with the remarks of his lordship. In himself he had not the least faith, wondered indeed which of them thought the other the greater fool to imagine that after all that had passed Donal would place any confidence in what the earl said. But he listened. What Lord Morven really had in his mind he could not surmise, but not the less to take Davy to his father and mother was a delightful idea. The boy was growing fast, and had revealed a faculty quite rare in one so young for looking to the heart of things and seeing the relation of man to man. Therefore such a lesson as the earl proposed would indeed be invaluable to him. Then again, this faculty had been opened in him through a willing perception of those eternal truths in a still higher relation of persons, which are open only to the childlike nature, whence he would be especially fitted for such company as that of his father and mother, who could now easily receive the boy as well as himself, since their house and their general worldly condition had been so much bettered by their friend, Sir Gibby. With them, Davy would see genuine life, simplicity, dignity, and unselfishness, the very embodiment of the things he held constantly before him. There might be some other reason behind the earl's request which it would be well for him to know, but he would sooner discover that by a free consent than by hanging back. Anything bad it could hardly be. He shrank indeed from leaving Lady Arctura while she was yet so far from well, but she was getting well much faster now. For a fortnight there had been no necessity for his presence to soothe her while she slept. Neither did she yet know, so far at least as he or Mistress Brooks was aware, that he had ever been near her in the night. It was well also because of the position of things between him and Lord Forgue that he should be away for a while. It would give a chance for that foolish soul to settle down, and let common sense assume the reins, while yet the better coachman was not allowed to mount the box. He had, of course, heard nothing of the strained relations between him and Lady Arctura. He might otherwise have been a little more anxious. For the Earl, Davy, he thought, would be a kind of pledge or hostage, in regard of what he could not specify, but, though he little suspected what such a man was capable of sacrificing to gain a cherished end, some security for him, some hold over him, seemed to Donal not undesirable. When Davy heard the proposal, he was wild with joy, actually to see the mountains and the sheep and the collies of which Donal had told him such wonderful things, to be out all night, perhaps, with Donal and the dogs and the stars and the winds. Perhaps a storm would come, and he would lie on Donal's plaid under some great rock, and hear the wind roaring around them, but not able to get at them. And the sheep would come and huddle close up to them and keep them warm with their woolly sides, and he would stroke their heads and love them. Davy was no longer a mere child. Far from it. But what is loveliest in the child's heart was only the stronger in him. And the prospect of going with Donal was a thing to be dreamed of day and night till it came nor were the days many before their departure was definitely settled. The Earl would have Mr. Grant treat his pupil precisely as one of his own standing. He might take him on foot if he pleased. The suggestion was eagerly accepted by both. They got their boxes ready for the carrier, packed their wallets, and one lovely morning late in spring, just as summer was showing her womanly face through its smiles and tears, they set out together. It was with no small dismay that Arctura heard of the proposal. She said nothing, however, only when Donal came to take his leave she broke down a little. "'We shall often wish, Davy and I, that you were with us, my lady,' he said. "'Why?' she asked, unable to say more. "'Because we shall often feel happy. And what then can we do but wish you shared our happiness?' She burst into tears, and presently was able to speak. "'Don't think me silly,' she said. "'I know God is with me, and as soon as you are gone I will go to him to comfort me.' but I cannot help feeling as if you were leaving me like a lamb among wolves. I can give no reason for it. I only feel as if some danger were near me. But I have you yet, Mistress Brooks. God and you will take care of me. Indeed, if I hadn't you, she added, laughing through her tears, I should run away with Mr. Grant and Davy. If I had known you felt like that, said Donal, I would not have gone. Yet I hardly see how I could have avoided it being Davy's tutor, and bound to do as his father wishes with him. 
Only, dear Lady Arctura, there is no chance in this or in anything. We will not forget you, and in three weeks or a month we shall be back. That is a long time, said Arctura, ready to weep again. Is it necessary to say she was not a weak woman? It is not betrayal of feeling, but avoidance of duty that constitutes weakness. After an illness he has borne like a hero, a strong man may be ready to weep like a child. What the common people of society think about strength and weakness is poor stuff, like the rest of their wisdom. She speedily recovered her composure, and with the gentlest smile bade Donal good-bye. She was in her sitting-room next the state chamber where she now slept. The sun was shining in at the open window, and with it came the song of a little bird, clear and sweet. "'You hear him,' said Donal. "'How he trusts God without knowing it. We are made able to trust him, knowing in whom we believe.' Ah, dear Lady Arctura, no heart even yet can tell what things God has in store for them who will just let him have his way with them. Goodbye. Write to me if anything comes to you that I can help you in. And be sure I will make haste to you the moment you let me know you want me. Thank you, Mr. Grant. I know you mean every word you say. If I need you, I will not hesitate to send for you. Only if you come, it will be as my friend and not— It will be as your servant, not Lord Morvan's, said Donal. I quite understand. Goodbye. The Father of Jesus Christ, who was so sure of him, will take care of you. Do not be afraid. He turned and went. He could no longer bear the look of her eyes. End of chapter 70《Chapter 71 of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 71 Glashgar. Out of Arctura's sight, Donal had his turn of so called weakness. The day was a glorious one and Davy, full of spirits, could not understand why he seemed so unlike himself. "'Arky would scold you, Mr. Grant,' he said. Donald avoided the town, and walked a long way round to get into the road beyond it, his head bent as if he were pondering a pain. At moments he felt as if he must return at once, and refuse to leave the castle for any reason. But he could not see that it was the will of God that he should do so. A presentiment is not a command.' A prophecy may fail of the least indication of duty. Hamlet defying augury is the consistent religious man Shakespeare takes pains to show him. A presentiment may be true, may be from God himself, yet involve no reason why a man should change his way, should turn a step aside from the path before him. St. Paul received warning after warning on his road to Jerusalem that bonds and imprisonment awaited him, and these warnings he knew came from the spirit of prophecy but he heeded them only to set his face like a flint. He knew better than imagine duty determined by consequences, or take foresight for direction. There is a higher guide, and he followed that. So did Donal now. Moved to go back, he did not go back. Neither afterwards repented that he did not. I will not describe the journey. Suffice it to say that after a few days of such walking as befitted an unaccustomed boy, they climbed the last hill, crossed the threshold of Robert Grant's cottage, and were both clasped in the embrace of Janet. For Davy rushed into the arms of Donal's mother, and she took him to the same heart to which she had taken wee Sir Gibby. The bosom of the peasant woman was indeed one to flee to. Then followed delights which more than equaled the expectations of Davy. One of them was seeing how Donal was loved. Another was a new sense of freedom. He had never imagined such liberty as he now enjoyed. It was as if God were giving it to him, fresh out of his sky, his mountains, his winds. Then there was the twilight on the hillside, with the sheep growing dusky around him, when Donal would talk about the shepherd of the human sheep. And hearing him, Davy felt not only that there was once, but that there is now a man altogether lovely, the heart of all beauty everywhere, a man who gave himself up to his perfect father and his father's most imperfect children, that he might bring his brothers and sisters home to their father, for all his delight is in his father and his father's children. He showed him how the heart of Jesus was all through the heart of a son, a son that adored his perfect father, and how if he had not had his perfect son to help him, God could not have made any of us, 
could never have got us to be his little sons and daughters, loving him with all our might. Then Davy's heart would glow, and he would feel ready to do whatever that son might want him to do. And Donal hoped, and had good ground for hoping, that when the hour of trial came, the youth would be able to hold, not merely by the unseen, but by the seemingly unpresent and unfelt, in the name of the eternally true. Donal's youth began to seem far behind him. All bitterness was gone out of his memories of Lady Galbraith. He loved her tenderly, but was pleased she should be Gibby's. How much of this happy change was owing to his interest in Lady Arctura he did not inquire. Greatly interested in her, more in very important ways than he had ever been in Lady Galbraith, he was so jealous of his heart, shrank so much from the danger of folly, knew so well how small an amount of yielding might unfit him for the manly and fresh performance of his duties, among which came first a due regard for her well-being, lest he should himself fail or mislead her, that he often turned his thoughts into another channel, lest in that they should run too swiftly, deepen it too fast, and go far to imprison themselves in another agony. To Lady Galbraith he confided his uneasiness about Lady Arctura. Not that he could explain, he could only confess himself infected with her uneasiness, and the rather that he knew better than she the nature of those with whom she might have to cope. If Mrs. Brooks had not been there, he dared not have come away, he said, leaving her with such a dread upon her. Sir Gibby listened open-mouthed to the tale of the finding of the lost chapel, hidden away because it held the dust of the dead, and perhaps sometimes their wandering ghosts. They assured him that if he would bring Lady Arctura to them, they would take care of her. Had she not better give up the weary property, they said, and come and live with them and be free as the lark? But Donal said that if God had given her a property, he would not have her forsake her post, but wait for him to relieve her. She must administer her own kingdom ere she could have an abundant entrance into his. Only he wished he were near her again to help her. End of chapter 71《Chapter 72 of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 72 Sent, Not Called. He had been at home about ten days, during which not a word had come to Davy or himself from the castle and was beginning to grow, not perhaps anxious, but hungry for news of Lady Arctura, when from a sound sleep he started suddenly awake one midnight to find his mother by his bedside. She had roused him with difficulty. Laddie, she said, I'm thinking you're wanted. What am I wanted, mother? he asked, rubbing his eyes, but with anxiety already throbbing at his heart. At the castle, she replied. How can ye that? he asked. It would be ill telling ye, she answered. But gin I was you, Donal, I would be off before the daybreak to see what they're doing with yon poor lady at the muckle place ye left. My heart's that sore about her I cannot rest a moment till I hae you away upon the road till her. Long before his mother had ended, Donal was out of bed and hurrying on his clothes. He had the profoundest faith in whatever his mother said. Was it a vision she had had? He had never been told she had the second sight. It might have been only a dream, or an impression so deep she must heed it. One thing was plain— there was no time to ask questions. It was enough that his mother said, Go. More than enough that it was for Lady Arctura. How quickest could he go? There were horses at Sir Gibby's. He would make free with one. He put a crust of bread in his pocket and set out running. There was a little moonlight, enough for one who knew every foot of the way, and in half an hour of swift descent he was at the stable door of Glashruach. Finding himself unable to rouse anyone, he crept through a way he knew, opened the door, without a moment's hesitation saddled and bridled Sir Gibby's favorite mare, led her out, and mounted her. Safe in the saddle, with four legs busy under him, he had time to think, and began to turn over in his mind what he must do. But he soon saw there was no planning anything till he knew what was the matter, of which he had dreadful forebodings. His imagination started and spurred by fear, he thought of many dread possibilities concerning which he wondered that he had never thought of them before. If he had, he could not have left the castle. What might not a man in the mental and moral condition of the earl, unrestrained by law or conscience, risk to secure the property for his son? Might he not poison her, smother her, kill her somehow, anyhow that was safest? 
then rushed into his mind what the housekeeper had told him of his cruelty to his wife. A man like that, no longer feeling, however knowing the difference between right and wrong, hardly knowing the difference between dreaming a thing and doing the thing, was no fitter member of a family than any devil in or out of hell. He would have blamed himself bitterly, had he not been sure he was not following his own will and going away. If there were a better way, it had not been intended he should take it, else it would have been shown him. But now he would be restrained by no delicacy towards the earl. Whatever his hand found to do, he would do, regardless of appearances. If he could not reach Lady Arctura, he would seek the help of the law, tell what he knew, and get a warrant of search. He dared not think what he dreaded, but he would trust nothing but seeing her with his own eyes, and hearing from her own mouth that all was well. Which could not be, else why should his mother have sent him to her? Doubtless the way would unfold before him as he went on, but if everything should seem to go against him, he would yet say with Sir Philip Sidney that, since a man is bound no farther to himself than to do wisely, chance is only to trouble them that stand upon chance. If his plans or attempts should one after the other fail, there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough-hew them how we will. So he rode on, careful over his mare, lest much haste should be little speed. The animal was strong and in good condition, and by the time Donal had seen the sun rise, ascend the heavens, and go halfway down their western slope, and had stopped three times to refresh the mare, he found himself, after much climbing and descent, on a good level road that promised by nightfall to bring him to the place of his desire. But the mare was now getting tired, and no wonder, for she had had more than a hard day's work. Donal dismounted every now and then to relieve her, that he might go the faster when he mounted again, comforting himself that in the true path the delays are as important as the speed. For the hour is the point, not the swiftness. An hour too soon may even be more disastrous than an hour too late. He would arrive at the right time for him whose ways are not our ways, inasmuch as they are greatly better. The sun went down, and the stars came out, and the long twilight began. But before he was a mile farther he became aware that the sky had clouded over, the stars had vanished, and rain was at hand. The day had been sultry, and relief was come. Lightning flamed out, and darkness full of thunder followed. The storm was drawing near, but his mare, though young and high-spirited, was too weary to be frightened. The rain refreshed both, and they made a little more speed. But it was dark night, with now grumbling, now raging storm, before they came where, had it been light, Donal would have looked to see the castle. End of chapter 72《Chapter 73 of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 73 In the Night. When he reached the town, he rode into the yard of the Morven Arms, and having found a sleepy ostler, gave up his mare. He would be better without her at the castle, whither he was setting out to walk when the landlord appeared. "'We didn't look to see you, sir, at this time,' he said. "'Why not?' returned Donal. "'We thought you was away for the summer, seeing you took the young gentleman with you, and the yearl himself followed.' "'Where is he gone?' asked Donal. "'Oh, didn't you can, sir. Hannah, you heard? Not a word. That's very strange, sir. There's a clean clearance at the castle. First good, my lord Forgu and sign my lord himself and my lady, and sign God the housekeeper. Her mither was dying, they said. I'm thinking there mun be a wedding to the fore. There was some word of fitting up the old house in the town, cause Lord Forgu didn't care about being at the castle any longer. It's strange you hadn't heard, sir. Donal stood absorbed in awful hearing. Surely some letter must have miscarried. The sure and firm-set earth seemed giving way under his feet. I will run up to the castle and hear all about it, he said. "'Look after my mare, will you?' "'But I'm telling you, sir, you'll find nobody there,' said the man. "'They're all gone for the house, any good. "'There's not a soul about that but deaf Betty Lobbin, "'who wouldn't hear the angel with the last trump. "'Mare by token, she's that feared for Robert "'she gangs till her bed the minute it begins to grow dark "'and sticks her head beneath the bedclothes. "'Not at that makes her any differ. "'Then you think there is no use in going up?' "'Not the smallest,' answered the innkeeper. "'Get me some supper, then.' I will take a look at my mare. 
He went and saw that she was attended to, then set off for the castle as fast as his legs would carry him. There was foul play beyond a doubt. Of what sort he could not tell. If the man's report was correct, he would go straight to the police. Then first he remembered, in addition to the other reported absences, that before he left with Davy, the factor and his sister had gone together for a holiday. Had this been contrived? He mounted the hill and drew near the castle. A terrible gloom fell upon him. There was not a light in the sullen pile. It was darksome even to terror. He went to the main entrance and rang the great bell as loud as he could ring it. But there was no answer to the summons, which echoed and yelled horribly, as if the house were actually empty. He rang again, and again came the horrible yelling echo, but no more answer than if it had been a mausoleum. He had been told what to expect, yet his heart sank within him. Once more he rang and waited, but there was no sound of hearing. The place grew terrible to him. But his mother had sent him there, and into it he must go. He must at least learn whether it was indeed abandoned. There was false play, he kept repeating to himself. But what was it? Where and how was it to be met? As to getting into the house, there was no difficulty. He had but to climb two walls to get to the door of Balliol's tower, and the key of that he always carried. If he had not had it, he would yet soon have got in. He knew the place better than anyone else about it. Happily, he had left the door locked when he went away, else probably they would have secured it otherwise. He entered softly, and with a strange feeling of dread, went winding up the stair to his room. Slowly, because he did not yet know at all what he was to do. If there were no false play, surely at least Mrs. Brooks would have written to tell him they were going. If only he could learn where she was. Before he reached the top, he found himself very weary. He staggered in and fell on his bed in the dark. But he could not rest. The air seemed stifling. The storm had lulled, but the atmosphere was full of thunder. He got up and opened the window. A little breath came in and revived him. Then came a little wind, and in the wind the moan of its harp. It woke many memories. There again was the lightning. The thunder broke with a great bellowing roar among the roofs and chimneys. It was to his mind. He went out on the roof and mechanically took his way toward the nest of the music. At the base of the chimneys he sat down and stared into the darkness. The lightning came. He saw the sea lie watching like a perfect peace to take up drift souls, and the land bordering it like a waste of dread. Then the darkness swallowed both, and the thunder came so loud that it not only deafened but seemed to blind him beyond the darkness, that his brain turned to a lump of clay. Then came a silence. And the silence was like a deeper deafness. But from the deafness burst and trickled a faint, doubtful stream. Could it be a voice, calling, calling from a great distance? Was he the fool of weariness and excitement? Or did he actually hear his own name? Whose voice could it be but Lady Arcturus, calling to him from the spirit world? They had killed her, and she was calling to let him know she was in the land of liberty. With that came another flash. And another roar of thunder, and there was the voice again. Mr. Grant, Mr. Grant, come, come, you promised. Did he actually hear the words? They sounded so far away that it seemed as if he ought not to hear them. But could the voice be from the spirit land? Would she claim his promise thence, tempting him thither? She would not. And she knew he would not go before his hour if all the spirits on the other side were calling him. But he had heard of voices from far away, while those who called were yet in the body. If she would but say whither, he would follow her that moment. Once more it came, but very faint. He could not tell what it said. A wail of the ghost music followed close. God in heaven, could she be down in the chapel? He sprang to his feet. With superhuman energy, he leaped up and caught the edge of the cleft, drew himself up till his mouth reached it, and cried aloud. Lady Arctura! There came no answer. I am stupid as death, he said to himself. I have let her call me in vain. I am coming, he cried again, revived with sudden joy. He dropped on the roof and sped down the stair to the door that opened on the second floor. All was dark as underground, but he knew the way so well he needed but a little guidance from his hands. He hurried to Lady Arctura's chamber and the spot where the press stood. Ready with one shove to send it yards out of his way. There was no press there. 
nothing but a smooth, cold, damp wall. His heart sank within him. Was he in a terrible dream? No, no, he had but made a mistake, had trusted too much to his knowledge of the house, and was not where he thought he was. He struck a light. Alas! Alas, he was where he had intended. It was her room. There was the wardrobe, but nearer the door. Where it had stood was no recess, nothing but a great patch of fresh plaster. It was no dream, but a true horror. Instinctively clutching his skein dew, he darted to the great stair. It must have been the voice of Arctura he had heard. She was walled up in the chapel. Down the stair, with swift noiseless foot he sped, and stopped at the door of the halfway room. It was locked. There was but one way left. To the foot of the stair he shot. Good heavens, if that way also should have been known to the earl. He crept through the little door underneath the stair, feeling with his hands ere his body was through. The arch was open. In an instant he was in the crypt. But now to get up through the opening into the passage above, stopped with a heavy slab. He sprang at the steep slope of the window sill, but there was no hold, and as often as he sprang he slipped down again. He tried and tried until he was worn out and almost in despair. She might be dying. He was close to her. He could not reach her. He stood still for a moment to think. To his mind came the word, He that believeth shall not make haste. He thought with himself, God cannot help men with wisdom when their minds are in too great a tumult to hear what he says. He tried to lift up his heart and make a silence in his soul. As he stood, he seemed to see through the dark, the gloomy place as it first appeared when he threw in the lighted letter. All at once, he started from his quiescence, dropped on his hands and knees, and crawled until he found the flat stone like a gravestone. Out came his knife, and he dug away the earth at one end, until he could get both hands under it. Then he heaved it from the floor, and shifting it along, got it under the opening in the wall. End of chapter 73《Chapter seventy four of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter seventy four A Moral Fungus. Spiritual insanity, cupidity, cruelty, and possibly immediate demoniacal temptation had long been working in and on a mind that had now ceased almost to distinguish between the real and the unreal. Every man who bends the energies of an immortal spirit to further the ends and objects of his lower being fails so to distinguish. But with the earl the blindness had wrought outward as well as inwardly, so that he was even unable, during considerable portions of his life, to tell whether things took place outside or inside him. Nor did this trouble him. He was past caring, he would argue that what equally affected him had an equal right to be by him regarded as existent. He paid no heed to the different natures of the two kinds of existence, their different laws, and the different demands they made upon the two consciousnesses. He had, in fact, by a long course of disobedience growing to utter disuse of conscience, arrived nearly at non-individuality. In regard to what was outside him he was but a mirror. In regard to what was inside him, a mere vessel of imperfectly interacting forces. And now his capacities and incapacities together had culminated in a hideous plot, in which it would be hard to say whether the folly, the crime, or the cunning predominated. He had made up his mind that, if the daughter of his brother refused to wed her cousin, and so carry out what he asserted to have been the declared wish of her father, she should go after her father, and leave her property to the next heir, so that if not in one way, then in another the law of nature might be fulfilled, and title and property united without the intervention of a marriage. As to any evil that therein might be imagined to befall his niece, he quoted the words of Hamlet, Since no man has aught of what he leaves, what is it to leave betimes? She would be no worse than she must have been when the few years of her natural pilgrimage were of necessity over. The difference to her was not worth thinking of besides the difference to the family, at the same time, perhaps a scare might serve, and she would consent to marry Forgue to escape a frightful end. The moment Donal was gone, he sent Forgue to London, and set himself to overcome the distrust of him which he could not but see had for some time been growing in her. 
with the sweet prejudices of a loving nature to assist him, he soon prevailed so far that, without much entreaty, she consented to accompany him to London. For a month or so, he said, while Davy was gone. The proposal had charms for her. She had been there with her father when a mere child, and never since. She wrote to Donal to let him know. How it was that her letter never reached him, it is hardly needful to inquire. The earl, in order, he said, to show his recognition of her sweet compliance, made arrangements for posting it all the way. He would take her by the road he used to travel himself when he was a young man. She should judge whether more had not been lost than gained by rapidity. Whatever shortened any natural process, he said, simply shortened life itself. Simmons should go before and find a suitable place for them. They were hardly gone when Mrs. Brooks received a letter pretendedly from the clergyman of the parish in a remote part of the South, where her mother, now a very old woman, lived, saying she was at the point of death and could not die in peace without seeing her daughter. She went at once. The scheme was a madman's, excellently contrived for the instant object, but with no outlook for immediately resulting perils. After the first night on the road, he turned across country and a little towards home. After the next night, he drove straight back, but as it was by a different road, Arctura suspected nothing. When they came within a few hours of the castle, they stopped at a little inn for tea. There he contrived to give her a certain dose. At the next place where they stopped, he represented her as his daughter, taken suddenly ill. He must go straight home with her, however late they might be, giving an imaginary name to their destination, and keeping on the last postboy who knew nothing of the country. He directed him so as completely to bewilder him, with the result that he set them down at the castle, supposing it a different place, and in a different part of the country. The thing was after the earl's own heart. He delighted in making a fool of a fellow mortal. He sent him away so as not to enter the town. It was of importance his return should not be known. It is a marvel he could effect what followed, but he had the remnants of great strength, and when under influences he knew too well how to manage— was for the time almost as powerful as ever. He got his victim to his room on the stair, and thence through the oak door. End of chapter 74《チャプター75》チャプター75の Donald Grant。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Donald Grant. By George MacDonald. Chapter 75. The Porch of Hades. When Arctura woke from her unnatural sleep, she lay a while without thought, then began to localize herself. The last place she recalled was the inn where they had tea. She must have been there taken ill, she thought, and was now in a room of the same. It was quite dark. They might have left a light by her. She lay comfortably enough, but had a suspicion that the place was not over-clean, and was glad to find herself not undressed. She turned on her side. Something pulled her by the wrist. She must have a bracelet on, and it was entangled in the coverlet. She tried to unclasp it, but could not. Which of her bracelets could it be? There was something attached to it. A chain. A thick chain. How odd! What could it mean? She lay quiet slowly waking to fuller consciousness. Was there not a strange air, a dull odor in the room? Undefined as it was, she had smelt it before, and not long since. It was the smell of the lost chapel. But that was at home in the castle. She had left it two days before. Was she going out of her mind? The dew of agony burst from her forehead. She would have started up, but was pulled hard by the wrist. She cried on God. Yes, she was lying on the very spot where that heap of woman dust had lain. She was manacled with the same ring from which that woman's arm had wasted, the decay of centuries her slow redeemer. Her being recoiled so wildly from the horror that for a moment she seemed on the edge of madness. But madness is not the sole refuge from terror. Where the door of the spirit has once been opened wide to God, there is he, the present help in time of trouble. With him in the house... It is not only that we need fear nothing, but that is there which in its own being and nature casts out fear. God and fear cannot be together. It is a God far off that causes fear. In thy presence is fullness of joy. 
such a sense of absolute helplessness overwhelmed arctura that she felt awake in her an endless claim upon the protection of her original the source of her being and what sooner would any father have of his children than action on such claim god is always calling us as his children and when we call him as our father then and not till then does he begin to be satisfied and with that there fell upon arctura a kind of sleep which yet was not sleep it was a repose such as perhaps is the sleep of a spirit again the external began to intrude she pictured to herself what the darkness was hiding her feelings when first she came down into the place returned on her memory the tide of terror began again to rise it rose and rose and threatened to become monstrous she reasoned with herself had she not been brought in safety through its first and most dangerous inroad but reason could not outface terror it was fear the most terrible of all terrors that she feared then again woke her faith if the night hideth not from him neither does the darkness of fear it began to thunder first with a low distant muttering roll then with a loud and near bellowing was it god coming to her some are strangely terrified at thunder arctura had the child's feeling that it was god that thundered it comforted her as with the assurance that god was near as she lay and heard the great organ of the heavens its voice seemed to grow articulate god was calling to her and saying here i am my child be not afraid then she began to reason with herself that the worst that could happen to her was to lie there till she died of hunger and that could not be so very bad and therewith across the muttering thunder came a wail of the ghost music she started had she not heard it a hundred times before as she lay there in the dark alone was she only now for the first time waking up to it she the lady they had shut up there to die where she had lain for ages with every now and then that sound of the angels singing far above her in the blue sky she was beginning to wonder she reasoned with herself and dismissed the fancy but it came again and again mingled with real memories mostly of the roof and donal by and by she fell asleep and woke in a terror which seemed to have been growing in her sleep she sat up and stared into the dark from where stood the altar seemed to rise and approach her a form of deeper darkness she heard nothing saw nothing but something was there it came nearer it was but a fancy she knew it but the fancy assumed to be the moment she gave way and acknowledged it that moment it would have the reality it had been waiting for and clasp her in its skeleton arms she cried aloud but it only came nearer it was about to seize her a sudden divine change her fear was gone and in its place a sense of absolute safety there was nothing in all the universe to be afraid of it was a night of june with roses roses everywhere glory be to the father but how was it had he sent her mother to think her full of roses why her mother god himself is the heart of every rose that ever bloomed she would have sung aloud for joy but no voice came she could not utter a sound what a thing this would be to tell donal grant this poor woman cried and god heard her and saved her out of all her distresses the father had come to his child the cry had gone from her heart into his if she died there would donal come one day and find her no no she would speak to him in a dream and beg him not to go near the place she would not have him see her lie like that he and she standing together had there looked upon with that came donal's voice floated and rolled in music and thunder it came from far away she did not know whether she fancied or really heard it she would have responded with a great cry but her voice vanished in her throat her joy was such that she remembered nothing more end of chapter 75《Chapter 76 of Donal Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 76 The Angel of the Lord. Standing upon the edge of the stone leaned against the wall, Donal seized the edge of the slab which crossed the opening near the top and drew himself up into the sloping window-sill. Pressing with all his might against the sides of the window, he succeeded at last in pushing up the slab so far as to get a hold with one hand on the next to it. 
Then, slowly turning himself on his side, while the whole weight of the stone rested on his fingers, he got the other hand also through the crack. This effected, he hauled and pushed himself up with his whole force, careless of what might happen to his head. The top of it came bang against the stone, and lifted it so far that he got head and neck through. The thing was done. With one more Herculean lift of his body and the stone together, like a man rising from the dead, he rose from the crypt into the passage. But the door of the chapel would not yield to a gentle push. "'My lady!' he cried. "'Don't be afraid. I must make a noise. It's only Donald Grant. I'm going to drive the door open.' She heard the words. They woke her from her swoon of joy. "'Only Donald Grant. What less of an only could there be in the world for her? Was he not the messenger who raised the dead?' She tried to speak, but not a word would come. Donald drew back a pace, and sent such a shoulder against the door that it flew to the wall, then fell with a great crash on the floor. "'Where are you, my lady?' he cried. But still she could not speak. He began feeling about. "'Not on that terrible bed,' she heard him murmur. Fear lest in the darkness he should not find her gave her back her voice. "'I don't mind it now,' she said feebly. "'Thank God!' cried Donal. "'I found you at last!' Worn out, he sank on his knees with his head on the bed, and fell a-sobbing like a child. She would have put out her hand through the darkness to find him, but the chain checked it. He heard the rattle of it, and understood. "'Chain too, my dove,' he said, but in Gaelic. His weakness was over. He thanked God and took courage. New life rushed through every vein. He rose to his feet in conscious strength. "'Can you strike a light and let me see you, Donal?' said Arctura. Then first she called him by his Christian name. It had been so often in her heart, if not on her lips, that night. The dim light wasted the darkness of the long-buried place, and for a moment they looked at each other. She was not so changed as Donal had feared to find her, hardly so changed to him as he was to her. Terrible as had been her trial, it had not lasted long, and had been succeeded by a heavenly joy. She was paler than usual, Yet there was a rosy flush over her beautiful face. Her hand was stretched towards him, its wrist clasped by the rusty ring, and tightening the chain that held it to the post. "'How pale and tired you look,' she said. "'I am a little tired,' he answered. "'I came almost without stopping. My mother sent me. She said I must come, but she did not tell me why.' "'It was God sent you,' said Arctura. Then she briefly told him what she knew of her own story." "'How did he get the ring onto your wrist?' said Donal. He looked closer and saw that her hand was swollen and the skin abraded. "'He forced it on,' he said. "'How it must hurt you!' "'It does hurt now you speak of it,' she replied. "'I did not notice it before. "'Do you suppose he left me here to die?' "'Who can tell?' returned Donal. "'I suspect he is more of a madman than we knew. "'I wonder if a soul can be mad. "'Yes, the devil must be mad with self-worship.' Hell is the great madhouse of creation. Take me away, she said. I must first get you free, answered Donal. She heard him rise. You are not going to leave me, she said, only to get a tool or two. And after that, she said. Not until you wish me, he answered. I am your servant now, his no more. End of chapter 76《ハプター77のドナル・グラント》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Donal Grant by George MacDonald. Chapter 77 The Angel of the Devil. There came a great burst of thunder. It was the last of the storm. It bellowed and shuddered. "'went and came rolling up again. "'It died away at last in the great distance, "'with a low, continuous rumbling as if it would never cease. "'The silence that followed was like the Egyptian darkness. "'It might be felt. "'Out of the tense heart of the silence came a faint sound. "'It came again and again at regular intervals. "'That is my uncle's step,' said Arctura in a scared whisper through the dark. "'It was plainly a slow step, far off but approaching.' "'I wonder if he has a light,' she added hurriedly. "'He often goes in the dark without one. "'If he has, you must get behind the altar.' "'Do not speak a word,' said Donal. 
Let him think you are asleep. If he has no light, I will stand so that he cannot come near the bed without coming against me. Do not be afraid. He shall not touch you. The steps were coming nearer all the time. A door opened and shut. Then they were loud. They were coming along the gallery. They ceased. He was standing up there in the thick darkness. Arctura, said a deep, awful voice. It was that of the Earl. Arctura made no answer. Dead of fright, muttered the voice. All goes well. I will go down and see. She might have proved as obstinate as the boy's mother. Again the steps began. They were coming down the stair. The door at the foot of it opened. The Earl entered a step or two, then stopped. Through the darkness, Donal seemed to know exactly where he stood. He knew also that he was fumbling for a match, and watched intently for the first spark. There came a sputter and a gleam, and the match failed. Ere he could try another, Donal made a swift blow at his arm. It knocked the box from his hand. Ha! he cried, and there was terror in the cry. She strikes at me through the dark. Donal kept very still. Arctura kept as still as he. The earl turned and went away. I will bring a candle, he muttered. Now, my lady, we must make haste, said Donal. Do you mind being left while I fetch my tools? No, but make haste, she answered. I shall be back before him, he returned. Be careful you do not meet him, said Arctura. There was no difficulty now, either in going or returning. He sped, and in a space that even to Arctura seemed short, was back. There was no time to use the file. He attacked the staple, and drew it from the bedpost, then wound the chain about her arm and tied it there. He had already made up his mind what to do with her. He had been inclined to carry her away from the house. Dory would take care of her. But he saw that to leave the enemy in possession would be to yield him an advantage. Awkward things might result from it. The tongues of inventive ignorance and stupidity would wag wildly. He would take her to her room and there watch her as he would the pearl of price. There, you are free, my lady, he said. Now come. He took her hands and she raised herself wearily. The air is so stifling, she said. We shall soon have better, answered Donal. Shall we go on the roof, she said, like one talking in her sleep. I will take you to your own room, replied Donal. But I will not leave you, he added quickly, seeing a look of anxiety cloud her face, so long as your uncle is in the house. Take me where you will, rejoined Arctura. There was no way but through the crypt. She followed him without hesitation. They crept through the little closet under the stair and were in the hall of the castle. As they went softly up the stair, Donal had an idea. He is not back yet, he said. We will take the key from the oak door. He will think he has mislaid it, and will not find out that you are gone. I wonder what he will do. Cautiously listening to be sure the Earl was not there, he ran to the oak door, locked it, and brought away the key. Then they went to the room Arctura had last occupied. The door was ajar. There was a light in the room. They went softly and peeped in. The Earl was there, turning over the contents of her writing desk. He will find nothing, she whispered with a smile. Donal led her away. "'We will go to your old room,' he said. "'The whole recess is built up with stone and lime. "'He cannot come near you that way.' She made no objection. Donal secured the doors, lighted a fire, and went to look for food. They had agreed upon a certain knock, without which she was to open to none. While she was yet changing the garments in which she had lain on the terrible bed, she heard the Earl go by, and the door of his room close. Apparently he had concluded to let her pass the night without another visit. He had himself had a bad fright, and had probably not got over it. A little longer and she heard Donal's gentle signal at the door of the sitting-room. He had brought some biscuits and a little wine in the bottom of a decanter from the housekeeper's room. There was literally nothing in the larder, he said. They sat down and ate the biscuits. Donal told his adventures. They agreed that she must write to the factor to come home at once and bring his sister. Then Donal set to with his file upon the ring. Her hand was much too swollen to admit of its being removed as it had been put on. It was not easy to cut it, partly from the constant danger of hurting her swollen hand, partly that the rust filled and blunted the file. There, he said at last, you are free. And now, my lady, you must take some rest. The door to the passage is secure. Lock this one inside, and I will draw the sofa across it outside. If he come wandering in the night and get into this room, he will not reach your door. 
Weary as he was, Donal could not sleep much. In the middle of the night he heard the earl's door open, and watched and followed him. He went to the oak door, and tried in vain to open it. "'She has taken it,' he muttered, in what seemed to Donal an awestruck voice. All night long he roamed the house, a spirit grievously tormented. In the grey of the morning, having perhaps persuaded himself that the whole affair was a trick of his imagination, he went back to his room. In the morning Donal left the house, having first called to Arctura and warned her to lock the door of the sitting-room the moment he was gone. He ran all the way down to the inn, paid his bill, bought some things in the town for their breakfast, and taking the mare, rode up to the castle and rang the bell. No notice was taken. He went and put up his animal, then let himself into the house by Balliol's tower, and began to sing. So singing he went up the great stair, and into and along the corridor where the earl lay. The singing roused him, and brought him to his door in a rage. But the moment he saw Donal his countenance fell. "'What the devil are you doing here?' he said. "'They told me in the town you were in England, my lord.' "'I wrote to you,' said the earl, "'that we were gone to London, and that you need be in no haste to return. "'I trust you have not brought Davy with you.' "'I have not, my lord.' "'Then make what haste back to him you can. "'He must not be alone with bumpkins. "'You may stay there with him till I send for you. "'Only mind you go on with your studies. "'Now be off. "'I am at home but for a few hours on business, "'and leave again by the afternoon coach.' "'I do not go, my lord, until I have seen my mistress.' "'Your mistress! "'Who, pray, is your mistress?' "'I am no longer in your service, my lord.' "'Then what in the name of God have you done with my son? "'In good time, my lord, when you have told me where my mistress is. "'I am in this house as Lady Arctura's servant, "'and I desire to know where I shall find her. "'In London. "'What address, please, your lordship? "'I will wait her orders here.' "'You will leave this house at once,' said the earl. "'I will not have you here in both her ladyship's absence and my own. "'My lord, I am not ignorant how things stand. "'I am in Lady Arctura's house,' "'and here I remain till I receive her commands. "'Very well, by all means. "'I ask you again for her address, my lord. "'Find it for yourself. "'You will not obey my orders. "'Am I to obey yours?' "'He turned on his heel and flung to his door. "'Donal went to Lady Arctura. "'She was in the sitting-room, anxiously waiting his return. "'She had heard their voices, but nothing that passed. "'He told her what he had done, "'then produced his provisions, "'and together they prepared their breakfast.' By and by they heard the earl come from his room, go here and there through the still house, and return to his apartment. In the afternoon he left the house. They watched him away, ill able, apparently, even to crawl along. He went down the hill, nor once lifted his head. They turned and looked at each other. Profound pity for the wretched old man was the feeling of both. It was followed by one of intense relief and liberty. "'You would like to be rid of me now, my lady,' said Donal. "'But I don't see how I can leave you.' "'Shall I go and fetch Miss Carmichael?' "'No, certainly,' answered Arctura. "'I cannot apply to her. "'It would be a pity to lose the advantage of your uncle's not knowing what has become of you. "'I wonder what he will do next. "'If I were to die now, the property would be his, and then Forgue's. "'You can will it away, I suppose, my lady,' answered Donal. "'Arctura stood thoughtful. "'Is Forgue a bad man, Mr. Grant?' "'I dare not trust him,' answered Donal. "'Do you think he had any knowledge of this plot of his father's?' "'I cannot tell. "'I do not believe he would have left you to die in the chapel.'" End of chapter 77